Hello everyone and welcome back to this brand new video series in which we are going to be talking about the ESCE 7's method in calculating the earthquake or seismic loads. And in this video series we are going to understand all the theoretical knowledge behind the ESCE 7, specifically the method called the equivalent lateral force procedure, what this is and how we can apply that. And of course in the end we're going to apply this not to this robot and make a comparison between a manual calculation and other robots calculation. And this is going to be a video series that will be coming out in quick succession. In today's video, we're going to be focusing on the calculation of the base shear. With that being said, sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Alright, now since we are going to be talking about the base shear, it's important to understand what a base shear is. A base shear is the amount of force required to vibrate the structure. This is usually done at the base level and that's why it's called base shear. Now the base shear later will be distributed in every single one of those um, stories, but that's not, our, that's not our problem today. So today we're going to be focusing on how to calculate this base shear. Now to kind of clarify what the base shear is, imagine you have a flag and you are basically waving the flag back and forth. Now when you want to wave the ba flag back and forth, you would be applying horizontal forces on the flag, making it move. The amount of horizontal force that you impart on the flag to move could be understood as being the seismic base shear. So that's kind of an analogy I want to basically say. Now in the ASC7, how does it approach the base shear? And also, why do we even have base shear? Well, we have base shear because the ground is moving back and forth, which will impart acceleration. And as we know from Newton's laws, if I have an acceleration, then I have a force. So if we know the ground acceleration, we can find the base shear. Now, the ASE code states that the base shear V is CSW. And this is taken from the equation 12.8-1. By the way, the section talking about the equivalent lateral force method is section 12.8 so you should go and check out check this out now here the question is what fraction of g represents earthquake so what i'm saying is the asce 7 approaches the idea of base shear as a fraction of the g loads because you know that m multiplied by a is a force here it says cs multiplied by m multiplied by g it could be understood that the asce code is basically asking how many g's am i applying on the structure or you could also understand it as being a fraction of the weight of the structure. Now, historically speaking, this CS is usually between 5% all the way until 25%. And this is, of course, typical values. You could go beyond those values, but those are the values I have seen before. So our objective is to find CS. Now, this is easier said than done. But before we dive into that, we need to see exactly what the method is that we are applying. The method is called Equivalent Lateral Force Procedure. And... When can we use it? So, what, so when are we allowed to use it? We are allowed to use it if we have a seismic design category of B and C, so a not so dangerous building, and this basically is without bounds. If our building is a little bit more dangerous at seismic category, categories D upwards, then we have some limitations. So the equivalent lateral force procedure can be used for the DEF categories, the more dangerous ones, but there are some limitations. But if you have design category B and C, there are no limitations. Now for the limitations for DEF, if the building is of risk category 1 and 2 with less than 2 stories, so in this case just risk category 1 or 2 with less than 2 stories, then something called regularity or irregularity doesn't matter. So it's a kind of strict relaxed condition. It is strict in terms of 2 story limitations, so you are basically at height of 10 meters or lower, but it's relaxed at being irregular. And the word regular is going to be mentioned later. You will see so many irregularities in the future of this video. So you will see what I mean by that. Now, this seems to be a limitation. Two stories are not structures we are interested in in this series. So I think that in this series, we are not going to talk about those things. Light frame construction is also a limitation that you could use. Now, why is light frame construction mentioned here? Because light frame construction means that your weight is small, meaning that your lateral load is small. So this is kind of, and again, a limitation on the DEF. You could have buildings with no structural irregularity of height less than 48.4 or more than 48.4. Now, we'll notice this a lot. This 48.4 seems to be mentioned everywhere. It seems that structures below 48.8 are kind of less strict than structures above 48.8. If the height is less than 48.8, 
then your fundamental period could be anything. Now, what is the fundamental period you ask? The fundamental period is basically the time needed for a structure to complete one full vibration. Going back, forth. If the structure is less than 48.8, .8, then it doesn't matter what the vibration is because the flexibility of the structure is still within bounds as it is 48.8. .8. But if it's taller, then there are limitations for the fundamental uh, period, meaning that it cannot be more than a limitation here. So keep that in mind. Also, if you have irregularities, of type two, three, four, and five in the, in the horizontal, or four, five A, five B in the vertical, then you can use it at a limitation of 48.8. .8. So, okay, those are the limitations you need to understand because you cannot use the method haphazardly. Otherwise, you would have to go and check other methods. If you want to see more details about other methods, check out table 12.6-1. There is even more talk. I mean, I really encourage you to go read it from the table. You will see that this presentation might be a little bit easier for you to understand. Anyway, we talked about irregularities, so it's time to talk about them. Irregularities can be split into horizontal irregularity and vertical irregularity. Let's talk about horizontal irregularities first. The first irregularity is torsional irregularity, and it has two parts, simple and extreme. Now, if you check out the code, you should you check out some complicated language. Let me read it for you. Torsional irregularity is defined to exist where the maximum story drift computed including accidental torsion with AX equals 1 at one end of the structure transverse to an axis more than 1.2 times the average of the story drift at the two ends of the structure. Torsional irregularity requirements in the reference section apply to only to structures which diaphragm are rigid or semi rigid. And for extreme torsional irregularity, you have the 1.4 instead of 1.2. This is not easy to understand, so allow me to show you this with a picture, because a picture is worth a thousand words. In a picture, I have simply a structure where I have a story drift. Now, this story drift happens because of structural forces. So if you check out, one side of the structure drifts at delta 1, and one side of the structure drifts at delta 2. Now, the average of those two deltas is this. So you can see that the average of the drift is delta 1 plus delta 2 over 2. So this means that the representative drift is basically the average of the smallest drift and the biggest drift. Now notice, if the maximum drift is more than 1.2 that average, you have a torsional irregularity. And if it's more than 1.4 that average, you have an extreme torsional irregularity. Now I don't know why, but for some reason, this picture is much easier than reading this. So of course, I think that I will present this and stick by that. The next irregularity is called re-entrant corners. Once again, if you check out, and by the way, we are at table 12.3.1-1. If you read re-entrant corners, it tells you, once again, some jargon that is basically less understood. So I have a picture for you, and that's the figure. Re-entrant corner means that the dimension of re-entrant corner is more than 15% of the dimension of the building. So this is easier to understand. The next irregularity is called diaphragm discontinuity. This means basically holes in the slabs. So if you have a slab and the hole is more than 50% of the slab area, like I have a slab and there's an opening more than 50% of that slab, then that's a diaphragm discontinuity. Or if the, if the change of the stiffness is more than 50% from one story to the next, meaning that the opening is less than 50%, but still two slabs, one of them has an opening and the other doesn't, the difference between the stiffness is 50%. That's the from discontinuity. The next one is out of plane offset. That's an easy task. You can even see there are no numbers here, but basically it is that there is discontinuity in the force resisting path. Basically, you have planted new columns or offset columns. It's very easy to detect. That's not a big deal. The last one is non-parallel system irregularity. What does this mean? This means that your slab is not rectangular or hexagonal. It's basically, for example, a triangle or i'm not sure i'm not sure but i think i can say any polygon that has an odd number of sides because if you have a rectangle or a square then you have parallel to the perpendicular axis x and y and even if you have an hexagonal hexagon you still have uh, some symmetry around the x and y so i dare to say that it's anything that has odd number of edges well the code doesn't say that the code says that the elements are not parallel or symmetric around the major orthogonal axis. So, who am I to judge? For the vertical irregularities, there is, of course, a something called stiffness irregularity. And those are simple stiffness or soft story irregularity and extreme stiffness, soft story irregularity. Well, let's take a look. Uh, basically, yada, 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 70% of the story above, 80% of the average. Or yada, 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 60 and 70. Now, what is this? 
Well, it basically says that if you have a story, let's say this is a story, then it has a stiffness. And you need to compare the stiffness of a story to two things, to the stiffness of the nearby stories. And to do that, the weak story shouldn't be less than 70% of the story above it or 80% of the average. Of course, this 70, 60, this 70, 80 is for regular. It becomes 60, 70 for extreme. Fantastic. Now, weight, mass, irregularity, that's easier even. It basically tells you that a story cannot weigh 150% more than the adjacent stories with the exception being a roof because nobody cares about the roof. And basically, that's what it means. It tells you that you can only play with the sizes up to a certain percentage, meaning you cannot just go change the setback or change the section of the resisting element by much. And the word much here is quantified by 130%. Fantastic. The next one is in-plane discontinuity vertical lateral force resisting element. This kind of, once again, talk, 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 but it means basically this. Um, for example, here in the lower level, you have three shear walls, one here, one here, and one here. And the upper floor, this shear wall here magically moved, and this is a discontinuity in the lateral force resisting elements. Simple said. Now, of course, here, this continuity in the lateral strength, there is something called weak story and extreme weak story regulatory. And you can see in a very simple picture that, uh, yeah, the 80% change is a weak story and 65% is an extreme weak story. Now, there are some exceptions. You should read the code, of course, uh, when you can ignore some of those irregularities. Now, this is something you should read. In my case, my structure is not irregular, so I will not be talking too much about this. But of course, if you want to become an ASCE 7 Pro, you should read everything there. I just want to mention that those uh, irregularities are not everything. You could have exceptions for that. Please double check the exceptions. Back to our equation. What is our mission objective? Our mission objective is to find base shear, which is CS times W. What does W ask? W is the effective seismic weight. Okay, this raises another question. What is the effective seismic weight? Well, according to 12.7.2, it is everything above the base, dead load, and things. So the entire dead load, including the self of the structure, with other things, are included into the seismic effective weight, but it must be above the base. And this answers the age-old question of, if I have a basement, of I have, for example, two-story basements below the ground, do I include the mass of the basements are below the ground? And the answer is, according to 12.72, no, you don't do this because it's above the base. Now, what is defined as a base? That's, of course, the engineer's intuition. So, okay, it's the dead load and the own weight and some things. Those things could be 25% of the live load if you have a storage live load. If partitions are subject to change according to 4.3.2 of the code, you would need a minimum of such and such. Like, we are talking about W, right? You want to calculate W. So you need to calculate the own weight of the structure. You need to calculate the dead load of the structure. And you need to include some stuff if it is applicable. If there is total weight of a permanent equipment, you should include it. If there is snow load, more than certain level, use 20% of that snow load. And if you have roof landscaping equipment like trees and whatnot, you should include them in the effective seismic weight. All right. Now, typically, typically in regular structures that don't have storage systems, it would be the own weight and the dead load. You could, as an engineer, opt to include some of the live load but of course, that's your engineering sense. Now, this answers the question of effective seismic weight. Now, by the way, there are also provisions here. This is the 432 I mentioned here. Now, something that kind of strikes me as odd, and I really need your help with this because it says, yeah, I have been scratching my head since ages about that. It's like 1272 says, if the partitions are subject to change, so 432, which is mentioned here, then use this. But in 432, it tells you, use this. So which one should I use? And this is a question I still am struggling to answer. But still, it's kind of a head scratcher, so I still have to think about this. All right, this is about effective seismic weight. What about CS? Oh boy, CS is going to be a story. CS is the seismic response coefficient, and it's based on ASCE 12.8.1.1. And this is a big story. Let's take a look on that. All right, now... The seismic response coefficient, CS, yes, is calculated based on equation, which is equation 12.8-2, and that's CS equals SDS R over IE. What are, the, what are those things, you ask? I'll come to that. 
Now this CS is being calculated by some magical equation and you will get a value. Now this value must be less than two limiting values, which once again need more magical value variables here. And they are based on 12.8-3 and 12.8-4. So this CS that you calculate must be, should be less than those CSs and also should be more than those CSs, which are based on 12.8-5 and 12.8-6. Now there is a ton of magical symbols that are mentioned here and we need to dissect them one by one. Uh, in order to find CS, we need to understand what SDS, R, IE, T, TL, SD1, and so on. All those things we need to understand. So that's our checklist for now. We need to understand those things. Now at least W is understood because we know what W is. It's the effective seismic weight and I talked about it. But the rest is still a mystery. So let's dive into them one by one. You might need to pause the video and go back and forth sometimes because you might want to double check again what SDS, for example, means. Now, to help you in your quest, anytime I explain something, you will see that there is a yellow here that tells you exactly what I'm explaining. And once it's done, you will see that the done symbol has been included. So you always know where I am in my explanation with this little here thing. Anyway, let's dive into it. So now we are talking about the response modification factor R. Now, this is based on a table 12.2-1. What R means, it is kind of a measurement of how good the system is. A higher R means a reduction in CS, thus a smaller base sheet. Because if you check out the equation, um, R is here in the denominator. So a higher R means less force. So a system that has a higher R is better suited for uh, seismic resistance. Now this table is huge. It's table 12.2-1 and it's three pages long. You should double check that. Now, unfortunately, A talks about building wear system, wall systems. I think B talks about, uh, I forgot, I think it was braced something and C talks about the moments, moment resisting frames. So anyway, what I'm saying is this R can be taken from a table and you should take it. And we will talk about this later when I do an example for you. So R seems to be threatening, but it isn't. It's actually just a, it's actually just a number. Now for the next thing I want to talk about is the importance factor. The importance factor is a little thing that measures how important your structure is. Now here it is mentioned in section 11.5.1. And the great, now you will see this a lot in the ASC code. It's kind of sending you back and forth. So you better have, like, if you want to study the ASC code, this is what I have personally. I have a copy of the ASC code filled with all those post-it notes and stickies to kind of send me back and forth. Because if you want to study this for a PDF, that's a nightmare. I don't recommend that. Now, if you think, cool, I want to print out the ASC code, then please make sure that you own it first before you print it, or you buy the paper copy first. Now, if you want to print it yourself, and you own it, it would be around 700 pages, so you better get yourself a good printer. Or just buy it. Anyway, it is mentioned in 11.5.1, which throws you back to 1.5-2. And it's not enough, because if you go to 1.5-2, you can see the seismic importance factor, which needs something called the risk category, which throws you again to 1.5-1. So let's take a look on the risk category. There are four categories. Two of them are easy and two of them are big questions for me personally. Now, seismic category one, and you should read it. This is a long read. Seismic category one is buildings that have low risk to human life. So basically, for example, greenhouses. There's not many people there, so it's low risk. Um, seismic category four are buildings designated as essential facilities. Those are strategic things. Those are things that a government would not function without. Those are responses, emergency services, military, and so on. And I think this is self-explanatory. Now, three is kind of strange. Three talks about buildings or other structures which could pose a substantial risk to human life. Now, the big question that immediately arises is, are residential buildings considered case two or three in importance? Lines are blurry because the question is, when is something substantial? There is an argument to be made, for example, high-rise buildings. Those are buildings with a lot of residential people there. So are they category three? I would argue yes. But what about normal residential buildings? Like normal buildings, are they category two? I would still argue yes. Now, it's kind of haphazardly. I have seen some softwares doing a cool thing here. For example, in a software that I have seen is, it says basically three, is that a building has more than 300 people in one area. Now, 
I haven't seen the 300 in the code, but I kind of understand where he's going. At least you need a decision here. So please tell me in the comment section if you have a better explanation of what substantial risk human life means. In my opinion, if I have a high rise building, I would go for category three. If I have a normal residential, I would go with category two. But of course, feel free to dis disagree in the comment section. Uh, category two is basically anything else. Uh, that's strange, right? Because category two seems everything else. And I would argue low rise residentials are here. Okay, now, what about TL? Because TL was also required for the S. Because look, what are we doing even? We are trying to dissect everything needed to calculate the base shear. So we are going through them one by one. TL is called the long period transition period. Now there are two words of period here, and that's a mistake. Long period transition period is odd, and the definition is that this is high level stuff. This is about spectral analysis. And it's a time period where the transition occurs from constant velocity to constant displacement. Meaning, in one segment, the constant velocity is king, and the other segment, the constant displacement is king. And that's your TL. Now, why would you need this? Because you have a lot of things that depend on TL. How do you get that? Maps. You see, there are a lot of things that are taken from maps, and TL is one of them. TL depends on the geographic location. You could check out figure 2214 if you want to see for the US, or check out online sources to find TL for your current location if you are outside the US. It's mentioned in 11.4.6 for more information. All right, what about T? T is the fundamental period of structure. This is based on our structure. This has to be determined as stipulated in 12.8.2. So if I have a structure, I need to approximate the fundamental period of the structure. Because once again, it's inside CS. You could establish this with knowledge of structure properties of displacement, like you could do a full-fledged analysis to find the fundamental period. Now, one idea would be to do a model analysis, get the Hertz's and invert them. But remember, those are multiple modes. So each mode has its own period because one over the frequency is the period. So which modes would you select? Would you take the first three? Would you take the biggest one of the first three? Would you take the first one? Would you take the average of the first three? I don't know, because I don't need to do that, because I can basically use this. Now, it shall not exceed Cu times Ta, so when you do this, you should limit it to Cu times Ta, where Cu is this and Ta is that. Now, this entire thing is thrown out of the window based on 12.8.2, because it tells you you could use something called Ta directly. Now, TA is the code attempting to approximate the fundamental period of the structure. So, okay, now our focus is on T approximately equals TA. So, how can I find TA? TA is basically CT H and X. Another thing. Now, what is this? This is equation 12.8-7. Now, you need to understand that the fundamental period depends on the height of the structure. The higher it is, the more it takes time to vibrate. And it's not a linear equation, because you can see hn power x. hn is the height of the structure, and power x is an exponent. ct is a modification factor, because not all structures are created equal. If you have a 10 meter steel structure, it vibrates differently than a 10 meter concrete structure, and that's why you have ct. So ct, I'm expecting, would depend on the type of material and type of structure. And that's true, because first of all, hn is the structural height, and it's generally the total height. More details about this in 11.2. It talks also about if you have a sloped section, you could take the average of the slope, but there is more details to be read in 11.2. CT and X, the exponent of the CT, are determined from table 12.8-7. You can see that a table depends on the type and the material. Now, if you have, for example, a concrete frame structure, you would be using this. If you have a frame, if you have a structure that is not defined here, you can use this. Meaning that this TA, all you need to do to find it is to know the height of the structure and the type of the structure. Fantastic. So we have dispelled something called T. There are other equations that can help you here. For example, 12.8-8 says TA is 0.1n. So 0.1 seconds times the number of stories. And this works only if you have more than 12 stories, are moment resisting frames, and story height is at least 3 meters. So a lot of conditions here, but still you can use it if you want. Furthermore, there is something for masonry I don't care about because I'm not a masonry champion, but there is something about masonry to be read. Now the last one are those SDS, SD1, and S1, all those stuff. How do I find that? And that's a long story, by the way. 
SDS is the Design Spectral Response Acceleration Parameter in the short period range. And I need to take a deep breath to be able to write, say this in one go. SD1, and my teaching assistant has messed up, SD1 is the Design Spectral Response Acceleration Parameter at the period of 1.0. Now, this is basically a percentage of G, and it is based on the period that you want to check. So a short period has a different G's loading than a long period. So how would I find those things? Well, it's called SDS and SD1. So those are design values. So how do I get those design values? Well, you get those design values from modified values. So the SDS you can take by using 2 over 3 SMS. And the SD1 you can use and by the way, why do I need them? Because of CS. You can find by using SM1. Okay, so still the question arises. Now, by the way, this is 11.4-3 and dash 4. And the question still arises, what is SMS and what is SM1? Well, SMS is FASS. And SM1 is FVS1. Now, this SS and this S1 depends on the position. Those are taken from maps. FA and FV takes the value from the map and modifies it based on the soil. SMS is the maximum, and that's why there is an M, is the maximum considered earthquake spectral response acceleration for short periods and for long periods. And this is based on 11.4-1 and 11.4-2. Okay, so now again I have another question. Since SMS is FASS and SM1 is FVS1, the question is, how can I find SS and S1? And how can I find FA and FV? Well, SS and S1 are mapped. Those are taken from resources. Meaning that now I have TL and SS and S1 taken from maps because those three things are location specific. They can be determined based on 11.4.2 or they can be found in maps. And there is even a USGS web page that can find those values for any location in the US. For locations outside the US, you need to check out online sources for those things. Now, what about FA and FV? FA and FV modify those maps based on the soil and site. Because yes, you could have an SS and S1 value for a city, but not all the places in the same city are the same because the site changes based on the soil. So we need to modify that stuff based on something called the site coefficients. Those are found in table 11.4-1 and 11.4-2. So those are the tables. And lo and behold, what do you need to use the table? Well, you need SS and S1, and that's okay, but you also need a site class. So now there is a bonus question. What is the site class, and how can I determine it? Well, to answer the bonus question, we need to find the site class. Well, you need to do some soil tests. Now there is a lot to be said about the site class. You should definitely check out 20.3-1, because it's a science in it of itself. But... There is a rough classification of A, B, C, D. And for example, a site class B means on rock, C means on dense soil, D means on stiff soil. And you can even see the, uh, I think it's called the standard penetration test or something, I forgot. And uh, there's a lot of conditions to be mentioned. So, well, that's uh, the site classification. Meaning that all of those points are to be needed and found before we can find something called the base shear. So, yeah. That's everything I wanted to talk about today. It was an introduction to the code as well as the calculation of the base shear. I hope you enjoyed. In the end, I want to give a base shear shout out to my dear channel members in the contributor level and the helper level whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as the support of the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with videos hopefully on time and with a certain quality I try to achieve and for that I am forever thankful. In the end, I hope you enjoyed the video and you found it beneficial. If you have enjoyed the video, then please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting, and so on. Especially subscribing, because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.